Okay, hi there everyone. Uh, welcome to um, your first structures course. Um, you guys were the first round doing it in the new layout. Normally in the past, students did fall and winter term in second year, and they went straight through and did structures one and structures two. You guys are doing structures one in this winter term, and then I won't see you for a year until structures two next year. I'm not sure how that's gonna go. Um, I used to almost treat it like one kind of continuous session. Um, so we'll make sure we do a good review of structures one at the beginning of structures two next year. Um, you guys have the added advantage this term that the last year of the old format was this year still. So this course was taught in the fall by me. So that means hopefully all the quirks and flaws that I could possibly make happened last term. Um, basically, uh, methods on how questions are asked on Quercus, um, technology has been checked. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Shannon Hilchey. Um, I have been teaching the structures curriculum for, uh, this is my seventh year teaching. Um, when I started, it was just structures one and two. Um, and they called me three days before the beginning of the term and said, can you start teaching? Um, then uh, we added an undergrad course um, that I also teach, and um, since then we've added in an elective as well. So last term was a bit of insanity. I was teaching three lecture-based courses, um, one to uh, 225 undergraduate students, one to 70 graduate students as a core course, and then one elective to 22 students. I had accepted higher than the normal amount simply because it was an asynchronous course and I thought that might make people's life easier. So I said, go ahead. It meant a bit more marking for me, but not much to anybody else. Um, this term I am teaching structures one and structures two. Uh, so the year ahead of you is in structures two, tied to the comprehensive studio right now. My life is absolute frickin' chaos uh, at the moment. Um, my husband and I had made the choice in September to keep our children home from school, um, or school and daycare. Um, Malcolm is four and Duncan is two. Malcolm started school this year virtually. Um, we knew that you know any head cold or the possibility of things shutting down again meant that um, we wouldn't be able to function properly. Um, Dave owns Blackwell Engineering, uh, which is a 60-person engineering firm that is, as you can imagine, ev everything that can't be done by anyone else falls to him right now. Um, I have my own structural engineering company that I run, um, and we have two small children home full-time. Um, so things are uh, exhausting, fun, Gah, is maybe the best way to describe it. Um, so you will find that I will record lectures at weird times. I'll try to, I'll, I'll post them as soon as they're recorded. Any, any little extra time you guys can get, I think, is the best. Um, but it, sometimes it might not be until, like, midnight on Wednesday. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to do everything I can, but there's no such thing as a schedule for us right now. Um, I have heard rumors that... Um, the Ontario government is going to make some additional changes possibly next week. Uh, the only thing that is saving us right now as a family from complete and utter despair is the fact that we have a nanny come in three days a week um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And Dave and I can both work um, from 9 until 4.30. Um, if they take away the nanny, um, I will lose two full days. A week that I can work, um, which um, I'm not quite sure how we'll how we'll handle that. Um, I have a feeling my microphone. I'm going to stop this, and then you guys might see a quick blip, and it might come back. Um, I have a feeling that I have no sound. Okay, I had sound um, last term. I it was on my birth the day before my birthday, and I had recorded six hours of lectures um, back to back, 
and posted them and I had just bought a new um, video camera and it turns out it had somehow disconnected my normal mic and I had recorded six hours of lectures with no mic. Um, and I, it was, I cried, there's not much, I was just so <laughs> overwhelmed that I couldn't deal with it. So I had a sudden worry that my microphone wasn't working because I'm not seeing it quite the same. Something has changed in my, um, my recording software, uh, but they, I just did a brand new update, so that could be it. I have done everything I can to try to make the technology work for both of us. Um, um, I invested in a better camera. It still has some quirks and flaws. Um, it took me a little bit of time to figure out the best way that I could also record um, uh, math equations. I think it's super helpful when you guys can see somebody's hand writing out the information because there is going to be math in this course. Um, so what I do is I stop the, the video, I turn the camera, I, I write, and you guys can see the notes happening on the paper, um, and then when we need to, we flip back. I found a way to make sure you guys can see my lecture slide and my video. Um, if I come over here, when I do the math, you will see that I will enlarge the, um, the video screen so that you can actually see um, what I'm recording or what, what I'm writing a little bit easier. And then I just minimize it. So sometimes it's nice to be able to see the face and hear it, see the words. Um, for anyone who str struggles or has hearing impairments, um, my understanding is, is that you can turn on closed captioning through YouTube. Um, a student last term said that it worked all year and then it didn't the last two lectures, but I didn't do anything different. Um, I'll try to be very uh, explicit if there's a question in there when I post it. Um, my husband um, is deaf in one ear, um, and we have closed captioning on, on our TV 100% of the time. Um, so I get it. I want to make sure that helps for people. Um, one of the things people said last term is that it was hard to see the mouse. So um, uh, the funny thing is, is with this recording software, there are only two options. A tiny little dot or this very much gigantic arrow. Um, as much as on my normal screen, it does the range as you make it, as you set it from the smallest size to the biggest size, it grows incrementally. Uh, the software will only register almost nothing or the biggest thing imaginable. Um, I changed it to pink to try to make it slightly more um, visible. Um, people with um, um, uh, any sort of um, special needs, uh, timeline constraints, um, uh, visual impairments, anything, let me know ahead of time and we can try to figure out how to make it work. Um, when I do quizzes, or we, we're not doing quizzes, that was the undergrad class, but um, assignments and very explicitly the exam, um, I find that on Quercus, any sort of like matching questions, you know, it will automatically number them and if I label things A, B, C, D, it changes the order and for anyone who struggles with de dyslexia, um, it can be really confusing. So I always try to um, label things by color, um, and so I pick distinct colors um, and then make the answers match that. Um, obviously that's not fair to anyone with who's colorblind, so I literally write the colors out so that it's, it tries to solve any dyslexia issues and um, color impairment problems. Um, those are all the things I've been able to think of so far. Um, I, I really want to do my best to try to make sure your needs are being met. Um, like I said, um, my life is bonkers. So uh, if it's something reasonable that I can do to help you, I will do it. Um, but I think probably most of those things have been captured so far. I'm sure there's one or two I've missed. Let me know. I can't, um, I need to know to be able to solve it. So if you just sit there waiting for me to solve it, I might not even know it's a problem for you. Um, someone has mentioned that there's a slight hiccup or glitch where um, uh, my mouth moving and the sound recording get disconnected slightly. Um, that I've looked into, I can't help it. Um, I can see it happening, like right now it looks like it's fine. Um, and then I'll look over in a minute and there's like a slight hiccup and there's a slight lag. Um, Internet is being used at a wild capacity in my house. This isn't live, so it shouldn't have an impact on that. Um, but, frig, I don't know. 
Um, just so you guys are all aware, it's it's early Sunday morning for me that I'm recording this, so um, you will probably see small minions uh, run through the background and my husband chasing after them. So, let's jump in. This is going to be a pretty easy lecture. In fact, the first few courses are more concepts, and we get into the heavy stuff towards the end of the term. Um, so I'm Shannon Hilchey. I uh, am still a practicing structural engineer. Um, I spent um, years working at Blackwell Engineering. I was an associate there. Um, uh, but when I married my husband, who owns Blackwell, I figured, you know what, we probably shouldn't work together and live together and be married, so let's maybe separate those two things. Uh, I went and worked for a while with a company called Cast Connects, um, doing structural steel castings. Um, my children are dumping toys out on the floor. Um, uh, they um, really cool, innovative company, doing something here in North America that hadn't really been done. Um, loved working with those guys. Uh, they were both um, people who had done their masters and PhDs at U of T in structural engineering. Um, and then started um, this company, and uh, they do amazing things. Um, I'll talk about them through the term a little bit, sometimes just because some of their images are so great that I've brought them in to express certain things. Um, uh, then I decided to start my own company in 2014. I do small-scale, high-end installation elements. Sometimes that can be whole buildings. Um, I tend not to do whole buildings, not because I don't love them, um, but as a one-person operation, uh, it can make it a little bit difficult. Um, I do a lot of art, canopies, feature stairs, um, kind of all the stuff that the architect loves the most, you know, the precious little gems within the project. So I get to work with architects when they're at their happiest, um, which works really well for me. Um, about four months after I had started my company is when U of T contacted me and asked me if I would start teaching the curriculum. I thought, you know what, let's see how it goes for a term. Um, and here we are seven years later. So, you know, something I really enjoy, um, and hopefully it's a thing that um, you guys enjoy a little bit as well. All right. So just to show you that I'm legit, um, these are some of the projects I've worked on over the years. This one was kind of one of my first major projects. Uh, I wasn't the lead engineer on it because I was just junior at the time, um, but I did all of the engineering. So um, there was a partner going to meetings uh, and dealing with the client, um, but I uh, did all the analysis of this. If anyone back when the borders were open had ever driven back um, at the Canadian Peace Bridge Plaza, you might have had to park under here and have your car torn apart. Um, but at least you had a beautiful view while doing it. Some of you um, have probably seen images of this, uh, this structure, um, or maybe if you've been in town when Doors Open Toronto has happened in the past, um, you might have gotten to go in and see this project. Um, this was the NCFS, or the Native Child and Family Services Headquarters in um, Toronto. Uh, the whole building on 30 College was a gut and reno with major renovations, structural renovations as well. Um, this image seems to capture everyone's heart and soul, though. Um, it was a reciprocal frame, um, modern interpretation of a longhouse. Um, the client, the architect, said to us, um, Dave and I, my my uh, my husband, said. We want, a, we want a modern longhouse. So we went away and we came up with a framing solution that wasn't very common at the time. Um, and we created a 3D model in AutoCAD because that was before uh, all the fancy 3D softwares um, that exist now. Um, uh, most people didn't even work in 3D CAD then. Uh, and we sent it to the architect and they said they loved it and they just forwarded our 3D CAD model to the builder, and there was no, there was no um, formal drawing process because we gave them the exact draw, the exact model that they had to just cut the wood to, to build. What doesn't get talked about a lot is the fact that this was built inside this shaped concrete building. 
right here is an opening that they put on all the floors. So they cut this in the middle of all the columns. So this was right here in the middle of the floor. And they put a skylight on the top and a stairwell going up through there. Um, most floors, it wasn't a problem. Um, on the roof, it became a problem because on the roof, they were also adding mounds of soil. They wanted, um, uh, they have a, uh, a smoking hut up there um, and um, playground for children. Um, so uh, they have like big mounds of soil, like 10 feet of soil. Uh, so a much increased load. We couldn't make the slab work by just adding concrete and rebar in the top of it. Um, so what we had to do was come up with a way that we could share load between a steel structure underneath and the concrete. Um, what we came up with was this system of steel beams. So you can see these like this, and they connected into the concrete columns. And you can see one here as well. And all of these little white dots right here are hydraulic jacks. So they put jacks in there, and the idea is that you jack the slab up and the steel down so that the steel is carrying load and it's unloading the concrete slab because you're pushing up on the slab, so you're counteracting the downward load, but that has to push against something. So now the steel is carrying the load that it's jacking up. Um, the thing that made this doable was that we had two methods to verify the load we were taking. Um, they were able to um, um, calibrate the hydraulic jacks to see that they were increasing at the appropriate amount. But also we were able to say we used steel that was strong but not stiff. And we're going to talk a lot about what the difference between strength, stiffness, and stability is in this lecture because it's really this beginning concept on how we talk about structures. Um, and so we needed something that was not that stiff but quite strong. And what we did was we said, all right, when your steel has moved this much, that should also calibrate to exactly what your force is in the hydraulic jack. So they had, they had, a, double, they had a way to double check their measurements. Um, great contractor. Um, and I went in and I got to see the steel after it had been installed. And oh my god, it was this beautiful web of steel in the ceiling and they had to fireproof it, so it all got hidden up and covered, which was such a heartbreak for me. But it's still there doing its job. Um, a, real, some really, uh, a really cool house by Drew Mandel Architects. Um, take a look at this cantilever uh, right out over the pool with nothing to really support it here um, and no place to have a truss at the back. Um, so uh, we transfer those loads into the ceiling um, a kind of really unique building structure. If you're, um, forget what ravine it's in, but if you're walking along the path, you can, especially in the winter, if you're out for a walk in Toronto on Ava Road, this is on Ava Road, um, you can stand on the trail and look and see this house, and it's actually truly stunning. Um, canopy for the Sisters of St. Joseph's project um, along the, uh, the, the um, not the Gardner, the Don Valley. Um, uh, so I did the canopy. Um, you can see that it is quite a long cantilever. Um, I'm going to tell you cantilevers will not save the world, but they do save my company quite often. Um, I'm pretty lucky that I get to do a lot of really cool cantilever projects. Um, and um, some of the uh, profs here in the landscape department at U of T. Um, this is Verdant Walk by North Design Studio. Um, just a, a cute little installation. The, thing, the big thing about this is that it was installed on, um, on the mall grounds um, and there was um, um, programming underneath here. So as much as it looks like a garden outside, um, very much like our path underneath here. Um, so we were connecting to a structure that had very rigorous protocols on how to connect to it. Um, Lausanne School of Engineering. Um, that um, Arab did the main building, but um, Blackwell and Fat Lab, in partnership, did the facade. 
Um, we did it in a very unique method where uh, building upon the lessons learned with um, the Longhouse at NCFS, um, nobody wanted to do it. Everybody was too intimidated to do it for the engineering side and fabricators said um, it was going to take too long and cost too much money. Um, so what I did was I ended up producing drawings that exported um, basically cut files. They could take the files and literally cut the steel directly from my files. Normally the process in Ontario is the engineers design it and produce drawings that are more or less a representation of what they want. The fabricator builds a model that is the precise cuts that they want. So we took out that step and brought in my scope of work um, uh, and saved the, the project a year of timeline, essentially. Uh, my baby, my gem, um, Varsity Center for High Performance Sports. Um, Pre-pandemic, if any of you were ever able to go into this building, um, it's a glorious, glorious building uh, that spans 54 meters over a basketball court that's under here. This does not actually touch the ground because the basketball court is underneath it. This is a true truss being supported from here to here. What we have here is just where lateral comes out. So this building in an earthquake wants to shift like this, we resolve that force here into the slab. Um, on the other floors, uh, or on the other bays of this building, we have a one-story deep truss um, from um, fourth to roof, and the third and second floor are hung from the underside of that. Um, truly a wonderful project. I just, I, um, right now being constructed not far away is the Robarts um, uh, library edition that I also engineered for Blackwell. Um, they they um, they hired me through Fat they hired Fat Lab to help them out on that. It's not very often an engineer gets to design a 54 meter span building bridge. I've gotten to do it twice so far, so uh, kind of a fun thing there for me. So Robarts is being constructed now. I should probably add some photos of it because it was pretty spectacular as well. Okay, let's start talking about the good stuff. How the course is laid out. So, your mark is broken into three parts. The first part is assignments. Uh, I will have them go live for you on Wednesdays every week. Um, so, the lecture might not be posted yet. Um, there is no timeline on it. Uh, well, there is a timeline you have the week to complete it. But there is no, once you started, you only have 20 minutes sort of thing. Um, so it's available for one week. Take your time. If you don't know the answer, stop, look it up, find the answer. There is no rush. So read it through early, make sure you get your head around it, and then slowly start to answer the questions. Um, I find that people that do bad on the projects and the exam have done bad on the assignments. Um, the assignments can be very easy marks that can be the difference between an A and an A+. Plus. Um, you know, you miss two assignments, that's 6% of your mark gone right there. Um, so they're not, they're usually not that long. Um, about the amount of time that you would probably have spent on a tutorial in the past. But you can spread it out over the week. Take your time. Talk to your friends. You are allowed to communicate with each other about the assignment. In fact, I encourage it. Um, uh, I don't consider it cheating because you are communicating and learning while you're sharing that knowledge. Don't finish, don't um, ask somebody who's already finished theirs to do yours for you. That is most definitely cheating and that makes me very, very sad. Don't make me sad, please. Um, but take your time, talk to your friends, try to get your head around it. If, if you decide to cheat, I obviously can't stop you, but you're going to be the one that suffers in the end. So let's try our best here. Um, submittal is 11.59 p.m. on the next Tuesday. I will, the next day, sometime during the day, post the answers. I used to have a tutorial that the TAs would do the answers on the board, and I didn't provide an answer sheet. You had to show up for the tutorial and write down the answers if you got it wrong. So you could look, and if you got the answers right, fantastic. 
and then um, if you didn't, you could write down the right answers. Because in my mind, the act of writing it out makes you learn it. It is, um, it is a time-proven method to help you learn. I'm not saying it's the only way, and it's maybe not the best way for everyone, but for the majority of people, especially people who are struggling, that simple act helps you get through it. Um, so if you find you got some things wrong, try it again. Try writing out the answers. Do whatever you can. Um, if you have questions throughout the week, submit them to the TAs. Um, they will do their best to answer it. They will not have all the answers. They are not structural engineers. They have gone through this course and have done well in it, but they aren't going to have all the answers. Um, if between you and the TA, you guys can't solve the problem, they will come to me with the questions because that means if you guys are struggling with it, other people are too. And so they'll come to me and I'll um, answer the question to the class so that everybody can benefit from this knowledge. Um, it's a little bit hard where we don't have that forum where somebody puts up their hand and asks a question and everyone in the back is going, yes, I wanted that question too. This is the way we solve that problem. So it's the, the equivalent of putting your hand up and me answering it. Submit your question to the TA. They will try to answer it, but they will also give me the list of questions that they've been asked throughout the week so that everyone can benefit. All the assignments in the end of the course have equal weight. It is going to look like they have different values on Quercus. I download Quercus because I just, I make the questions worth a certain amount. And so, I don't know, I think this week the assignment is 16 points. Next week might be four points. The week after might be 22 they will all be worth 3% of your term. So don't, don't, don't take that as a, uh, a ranking throughout the term. So I will download them at the end of the term and put it into a spreadsheet. I also like to compare and see how everyone did. If, you know, if everyone only got 50% on one, obviously I'm gonna do something about that. That doesn't seem very fair. I, I don't want you guys to fail. And if everybody's doing bad on something, I've, I screwed up, not you guys. If you cannot submit your assignment, please let me and the TAs know prior to the submittal date. I will do everything I can to help you out with an extension. But if two weeks after the due date that you're like, yo, prof, forgot to submit it. I don't know, you should have told me then, I don't know. But if you say, listen, this is what's going on, I will do whatever I can. If I see a repeated pattern of something like that, um, it might become a little bit harder to help you out. Um, if you have um, a, a medical reason, um, obviously the, all of the profs have been instructed to help everyone out as much as possible. Um, but do start the process of contacting um, student services um, because uh, it certainly helps us, or at least it helps me when the administration asks me questions because sometimes they um, periodically review um, kind of submittal dates on Quercus. Um, and so that just lets me have all the answers for them about what's going on. The project. The project has two parts. Um, it is due the last day of the semester. I believe that is April 30th this year. Um, so it's after exams, after reviews, you get to submit your uh, project. That date has been set by the director and the administration. I used to like it to be the last day of classes. They said students are too stressed from their studio projects. Fair enough, I get it. Um, so we'll put it at the last day. The problem then is that I have five days to do all the marking of two courses. Um, so I have hours and hours and hours. I have about 30 hours of marking to do in five days. So they have to be due then, and I have to submit my marks. So if there is a reason you can't submit your project by the deadline, we have to have the buy-in from the administration, or at least have communicated that with the administration. Um, so that isn't, a, that isn't coming from me, that is coming from them. You have to start that process where you email them and let them know, and probably it will be okay, but if you just don't hand it in, there are consequences to that. So communicate, talk. definitely communication is key here. Um, I believe I already have the project 
haha, look at me ahead of the game. Uh, the project information posted for you guys, so it's up there. Take a look at it. Um, like I said, it's not due until the last day of class, but especially part one, there are things you can start thinking about. Part two, you don't have the knowledge to do it yet. Um, we'll start to finish that up towards the end of the term. But part one, you can at least start getting your head around. And the idea there is that you're going to pick an everyday static object. What does static mean? Because that's one of the very important things we're going to talk about in this term. Static means not moving. It's something that can resist all the loads that are on it by not moving around in space or spinning. A door opening is not static. It's a mechanical object. It is moving when the force is applied to it. Is it working the way it's intended to? Yes, but it is not a static object. A door when it's shut and stuck and you push on it and you can't get it open, that is static. Is it working the way it's intended? No. But is it safe? Does it break? No. So it is a static object. It is, it is strong enough to resist those loads. So what you're going to do is try to illustrate how your thing is stable. And we'll do that with free body diagrams. I'm going to talk about that later in the term. You need to talk about the loads that are on it that it would need to be strong enough to resist. And you would talk about anything um, that would make it uh, or what it would need to do to be stiff enough for things. And then part two is going to be determining the loads on a beam in a building that I give you, which again is already posted. Um, so that's all of your information for your projects so far. We'll talk about it more in the term as well. The exam. The exam is obviously on Quercus now. Um, I make a series of questions, um, so if I pick a question about this particular topic, I'll make two or three variations on it, all equal difficulty. Um, there are uh, mathematical questions where um, the variables change, so not everybody gets the same question. Um, that is a mandate from the administration to try to help limit cheating. Um, not that I think you guys are setting out to cheat, I don't. Um, but they've told us to just to make it slightly more difficult if possible. We'll take away the temptation, if you will. Um, there'll be a variety of questions, and you're going to get to test all of those out throughout the term with the assignment. Um, the assignment obviously doesn't have the time constraint that you will in the exam, so take that opportunity to practice. <clears throat> um, you're going to see that there are a lot of downloads and tables and charts posted for you guys as references throughout the term. Um, it's a little bit different now. It used to be that the exam, you sat in a room with um, invigilators and you were just, you could only have um, a certain amount of stuff um, and you would have had to print everything off. It was open book, but you would have had to print everything off that you wanted there because you couldn't have your computer. Um, uh, so what I would always do was make an appendix. And that had all of the key things that I had determined you would need from those printouts to complete the exam so that you didn't have to print out all of the printouts. You'll need to print the sizing guidelines or find a way to print them or have them open on your computer because you will want those for the exam. Um, but everything else, I will um, make sure you have a quick reference for it. And I still do that, even though it's just um, an online version of the exam, and you could technically have everything open. You are allowed to have things open on your computer. Um, I am not saying you need to print everything off. I know that Quercus can um, tell me if you leave that particular browser page, um, uh, but I am not. I'm not. I'm not going to go that far in the monitoring of the exam. I just. I think. I think you guys would only be penalizing yourself, so uh, try to just only open the things that are appropriate to be opening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat this like trust here, because you guys are a bunch of adults, you can manage this. Um, uh, so I will, I will give you that appendix, and I'll give that appendix to you even prior to the exam. So you can just say, oh look, she's cut it down to this, so you know, obviously I don't need these 500 sheets of paper. Here are the 20 that she's made accessible to us, just as a quick, easy reference. Studying for the exam, I always recommend, even though it's open book, while you're studying, 
pretend it isn't, and that you're allowed one or two pieces of paper um, as a quick reference guide. And then you still have everything else available, but these two or three sheets of paper should have most of the references you would need that you figure out you need. Um, so lists that I have in lectures, anywhere where I said, ooh, this makes a good exam question, have that written down. Um, anything that's an equation, probably something I love to ask a question about. I am pretty generous where I say, hot tip, good exam question right here, uh, probably means it will be on the exam. So the classes, um, the PowerPoints are available to you um, that you can go through whenever you want and take a look at. Um, you also have reference to them where you can see them in this video. Um, the PowerPoints are usually posted a couple days before the lecture, unless I am completely overwhelmed, uh, and then maybe that day. The videos will be a link, they get posted to YouTube. I know there's all kinds of people that are like, uh, don't share my stuff and don't publish it and it's private and there's all these waivers. People want to watch my videos? Fantastic, I'm not shy. Um, so on Quercus, I will post the, um, the uh, YouTube link. Um, the first slide will always outline the lecture and the learning points I expect you to ma master throughout that course. The last slide will, will last slide will always be a bit of a summary of those same things. Tutorials. We're not really having a tutorial um, in the way that you would think about it standard. Um, assignment questions will be available the day after the due date. You need to submit questions to the TAs one by one week after that lecture. So try to get your questions in during the assignment week. So if you take a look at the assignment and something's messing you up, ask the question early. Um, sometimes I'll have students um, email me at like 10 p.m. on Tuesday in a panic saying the TA hasn't answered my questions. Um, and then I see that the email went out at 5 p.m. on Tuesday. So the TAs are available, but um, try to respect their timelines as well. Try to get the questions into them a little bit early so that they have time to answer them and then you can do something with that answer. Um, if I get a, a good list of questions, I'll send out an email, um, or if required, I'd make a little video that kind of tries to answer those questions. Um, there are 70 of you, actually, yeah, there's 70 of you and 90 in my other course. Um, if everybody wants to send me a question every week, I simply would be overwhelmed. So start with the TAs about whatever. Um, due dates, extensions, anything. Start with the TA. Um, if the TA can't answer the question, that's when you come to me. Um, it's not that I don't love to hear from you guys. I really, really do. Um, it's just that I, I would be so overwhelmed with communicating um, on an individual basis with you guys. And then, and then I wouldn't be having time to make the lectures um, appropriately. So, Let's start with the TAs and then move up the process from there. Um, make sure you say what course you're in when you email me. If you just email me and say, I didn't understand question four from assignment three, I'm teaching multiple courses, so you have to let me know. Um, I, uh, there are a lot of you and I'm not gonna learn everyone's names, especially just because of email. So definitely put your course in the email so that I know what it is. Like I said, two-year-old, four-year-old, oh, the time. Um, so I am definitely doing what I can. Just try to be kind when you're uh, uh, making use of my time. So my job, to meet the requirements set out in the class lesson plan, uh, meet the needs of the majority of the class. Um, so what do I mean by that? There are going to be a few people that are going to be bored by this class. Um, good for you, I'm very proud of you, and I'm very happy for you. There are going to be people that are overwhelmed by this class. Um, for those people, try to arrange um, uh, TA help. And TA help and um, maybe a tutor as early as possible if you can. 
Um, my focus has to be the, ma the majority of the class. So it's probably the majority of the class that is in that middle zone. Um, I am happy to answer questions for anyone that's struggling, um, as will the TAs. Uh, but if you think that's not going to do enough, try to set up something with somebody um, uh, to help you out. And then the last thing is I need to be reasonably available. Um, we're all in crisis mode. And this is the thing, as much as I'm in a crisis, I get that you guys are all as well. Um, so I will do, hey Dave, want to say hi to all my lovely new students? Hello. Okay. Uh, they dumped out weeds all over the floor. It's a kit of 500 beads. Um, so uh, I will be reasonably available. The TA's job. I didn't used to add this. Um, I'm adding it now. Um, they have to have a pretty good understanding of the concepts. But like I said, they are, they are not structural engineers. Um, they will not have all the answers just because they haven't been exposed to as much as I have. It's not fair for them to expect them to be. Uh, but definitely start with them. They can probably answer the majority of the questions. <laughs> Duncan? Duncan, do you want to come say hi to the students? Oh, he has no pants on? Okay, yeah, that's probably not a thing to put on YouTube, is um, naked toddlers. Um, so the TAs, we've set up something. This is one of the big things I got from feedback from last term. Um, some students have a hard time just writing the email. They want to be able to ask um, the, the TAs um, questions. So the TAs are going to be, each one is going to pick a two-hour time slot at different points during the week. Um, to try to help with schedules across the board, um, that they will be available. You do not have to communicate with them then. You do not have to sign in. You do not have to check in. But it will be a time frame where they will be available, probably on Zoom. They might pick a different format. It's whatever they're comfortable with. They are managing their two-hour session, each independently, where you can communicate with them and ask questions. Um, if we find what the TAs are going to do is kind of keep track of those questions. Um, and if there's something um, that's going to be helpful to the rest of the class, they'll make sure they let me know so we can add that into that communication to the whole class. Um, the TAs are not tutors. They're, they're there to answer questions and help you out. Um, but they are not there for you for, to be a tutor for you for an hour or two hours each week. That isn't what they're there for. They're there to give everybody an equal amount of time. Um, yeah, you can say hello to them. Hello. Who are you? I'm Daddy. How old are you, Duncan? How old are you? How old are you? <laughs> You're being shy. Duncan is two and three quarters. Aren't you done? And then see daddy. Yeah. Do you want to go back and see daddy? Um, so the TAs are not tutors. If you require more one-on-one -on -one time, definitely contact them or contact someone and try to arrange something. You can communicate with student services and they can try to put you in touch with someone that's going to help out. <laughs> Your job. This is turning into a longer lecture than I hoped. I still have to go get groceries and clean the house and do laundry. Work for four hours. Uh, uh, okay, so your job um, is watch all the posted videos. That's expected. That's the equivalent of your lecture time. Um, we have three hours, 12 times this term. They're not all going to be three hours. There's going to be a couple that are going to be three hours. Um, you have the ability to pause a video, walk away, go to the bathroom, come back. Um, so there's some luxuries here that you wouldn't have had um, in the past. Um, you should review all the PowerPoints, um, whether you're following along on the side or just watching them here. Um, you should review all the examples that I do. Um, download all the material. You should submit your questions to the TAs. Complete all the assignments. Like I said, that's easy marks. Complete those assignments. 
You should complete the project and study for the exam. In the project, I write out pretty clearly what my expectations are. Make sure you read it and make sure you do all the things I ask for. Um, my marking system is pretty concise. Did they do this? Yes, you get the points. Um, um, uh, so try to follow that pretty well. If you, if you skip a whole thing, I can't give you marks for it. Um, if you require an extension for anything, um, please contact Student Services, but let me know. Um, they're backlogged as well, um, so if you just say, I'm starting that process, I'm going to take you at your word that that process is happening, um, and we will do what we can to give you everything you need. Uh, this one's kind of less take notes. That, that was more appropriate when we were doing the lectures live. Um, you have the advantage that you get to go back and watch the videos whenever you want. Um, calculations, it's helpful, just maybe even at the beginning of the term, have like a little sheet beside you that's the beginning of your, um, think of it as a cheat sheet for the uh, exam, where you just write down all the calculations and any lists and any equations. It's going to be super handy to just have reference to those. Like I said, I'm very nice about hints if you pay attention, um, and I like pointing out good exam questions. I don't want you to fail. Do you know how much paperwork it is for me if somebody doesn't do well or if they fail? It is the worst. I basically go on trial. I have to prove that you deserve to fail. So just make it so that I don't have to do that. Let's, let's just all get great marks this term and we'll all have less to do uh, in April then. That would be wonderful for me, thank you. One of the number one questions I get is, why is there no textbook? Um, I wish there was a textbook, um, but there isn't, and here's why. We do um, a couple, we do two lectures on statics. Um, the book that would be used for that would be Hibbler Statics of Statics and Dynamics. It's a two-part book that is $180. Um, then there's Hibbler Structural Analysis that is $90. Those are both American books, major for the most part following American codes with um, American units. So a lot of Imperial stuff, which we touch on Imperial, but we don't do as much of it as they do in the States. Um, and their codes are different. So things like um, um, load factors that we're going to talk about in a couple classes are different than ours. Similar, but not the same. So all of the examples are wrong for us. Um, the methodology is the same, but any examples aren't the same. Um, the National Building Code of Canada plus the commentaries, that is our Bible. That is the majority of what we're following is part four of the NBCC. But you can't buy just part four. You have to buy the whole thing and it's $435. But then we also have the stipulation that what we're technically following is the OBC, which is the Ontario Building Code of Canada. It references the NBCC a lot, but there are some things that are very particular to the OBC, and that is $90. And then, especially when we get into next term, we have all the different materials that we specifically design to. So we have concrete, wood, and steel, each with their own association and design code and manual um, that are 225, 400, and 230. Technically, we could probably even add in the masonry one in there as well, which they even stopped printing it, and so you have to go try to find relic versions of it, um, and they're, they run like $150. So, and we only need like a handful of pages from each one of these books, and that just seems horribly evil on my part. So what I do, and most of those downloads that you have that I've put on Quercus that are already there, are the relevant pages from these things. And then the course is me basically explaining how all of these things are used. Um, I have made a lot, oh, hey Dave, you should say hi, just because. Well, I, I yeah, got a wave, hi. Yeah, so this is Dave, my husband, structural engineer extraordinaire. Um, you'll see us communicate sometimes. Malcolm, you can come say hello. Do you want to come say hello? Did you cut out a giant? Come here. Come show my students your giant. This is Malcolm. Say hello to everyone. Oh, that's a nice giant. Malcolm's right here. Malcolm made a giant. 
Um, so like I said, we only need a small portion of each one of those, those books. No. Oh, that's a nice little, what is that, an imp? It's a boat. It's a boat. It's always a boat. Um, so every single example would need to be reworked. So I have essentially done that. I've made all my own. You made a boat? Um, I've made all my own examples. Um, as you can imagine, there is a clear message that I'm trying to give in each example, and it is extraordinarily hard to make a question with a known answer or with a methodology or capture all of the things I'm trying to ex express. So um, making a question takes about five times longer than solving a question. Um, over the years, I've added more and more and more. There are lots of examples. I'm always going to get someone at the end of term saying, you need to give us more examples. I'm going to say, go back and try the ones that are already there. We've covered all the things. Um, if you feel so inclined, Google things. I know I probably shouldn't say that, but the methodology is very similar. Um, I can't share with you other people's publications and works without the rights. You can Google things and find those things on your own. Um, and so if you're having, if you're having trouble with equilibrium questions, wow, Google equilibrium math examples. You will find a gazillion of them that you can work through. But what I've given you should be more than enough to try to solve everything you need to in this course. But if you are someone that learns by more examples, I will not be offended by you going through and trying those problems. Feel free. I'm an examples person. I like to do math to solve problems. Um, there's also online resources. Sometimes people like to hear another voice say the same thing. Um, this is this is one that goes around um, every year. I find um, it's a uh, it's a gentleman going through the structural analysis component for the. Um, what is it? This is a boat. It's a boat too. You like boats, eh? Are boats your favorite? They see it. Everybody's going, ooh, and ah. Oh, okay, Duffy. Oh, I love you. I made it. Yes, you did. You make good things. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so this is written with, so it's, it's done following the American, um, uh, codes, um, and it's to help them pass the structure exam for the American um, tests for our practicing architects. Um, so again, uh, American codes, so things aren't exactly the same, but the concepts are the same. Um, the way they do things are the same. The values and what they multiply them by might be slightly different. Um, so feel free to follow those as well. You're going to see that the information is identical to what I say. I even show a few videos in this where you'll hear other voices saying the same thing as well. Just so that you see I'm not full of, full of it um, uh, so that you have um, um, references. Um, at the end of the term, you will get uh, an evaluation form to fill out. Um, the point of that evaluation form is to help improve the course. Um, you can give me a bad review, that, that's fine, um, but it's less helpful in making the course better. If there are things that you think could improve the course, you got to let us know and that's one of the ways to do it. Um, sometimes it's things that can help the administration out, sometimes it's things that can help me out. I get to see the comments. It's anonymous, it's completely private, but I get to see the comments to try to help me make the course better. If you want to write, I don't like um, Shannon's hairstyle. Well. That's fine. You can write that. It's going to be less helpful to make the course better. But if you think there's something that could make the help course better, I would there's gladly no take it under consideration. That's a lot of good boats, Duncan. Um, I think they've seen enough boats. Um, um, one of the uh, comments I got one year was that I swear too much. Um, I will try my best to limit my swearing, um, but I am, um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Trailer Park Boys. I grew up beside that trailer park, the, the literal trailer park where it was filmed. Um, so, you know, everything in that show is basically uh, how I grew up. So, um, uh, I have to really try hard not to swear, and I will try my best. But if I slip one in sometimes, I'm really sorry. 
Um, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm not doing it for shock value. I am just 100% being myself. Okay, so why are we all here? Why are we bothering with this course? What's the purpose? You guys are training to be architects. You're gonna hire an engineer. What do you need to know about structural engineering? Well, here's the thing. Most of the major decisions about the structure are made long before the engineer is even talked to on a project. You, as the architect, are usually picking a material, doing a layout. So where are your columns? Where are your walls? What direction are things spanning? And you've probably even done a round of preliminary sizing where you actually say, okay, well, my floor assembly is going to be this big and my steel is going to be this big with this amount of decking on top. Because you're going to communicate with that owner before the owner decides to pull the trigger and actually start the full design process. And that's when you'll come to an engineer and say, okay, let's go on this. And if you find out those preliminary sizes are way off, you would assume you needed this floor assembly because your steel was this big, well your floor assembly actually needs to be this big because your steel is this big, that's going to change headroom in a building, um, maybe uh, you need to increase your story to story height, and if there's a cap on the height of the building you lose a whole floor of your building, so the consequences can be dire and you're making them long before you have an engineer. So you need to know why do I pick what material? How far can each of those materials span? And once I make that choice, what size do those things need to be? Roughly, it's not the final answer, but you want to be pretty darn close. And you want to make sure, if you're not sure if it needs to be here or here, you want to draw here so that if it's this, it fits. But if it turns out to only be this, oh, you've got some extra room. It would suck to find out it needed to be this and it doesn't fit in your floor to, into your floor space, into your, um, your top to soffit. Um, you also need to understand limits to different materials. You have to understand that a small change can sometimes have a big impact. And you need to understand the relationships between depth, strength, and deflection. Now these things all come more or less while the engineer is involved. Um, we're going to talk about this, these relationships um, between depth and length and strength and deflection um, and how making um, a small change to depth or length can have big impacts on strength and deflection, um, whereas changes in width can have a relatively nominal change. These can be difficult concepts and we are going to be doing math. We are going to, I can't get away from it, we are going to do math. I, wa I work very hard on talking out the steps, and as we get good at something, we shorten it down. So I'll say, you guys have all done this step 10 times now, and kind of cut that process out. If you find math terrifying, get a tutor now. Work on this. I'm gonna show you in the next few slides, or a couple slides from now, the basic math concepts that you have to start being able to do quickly. You need to be able to do those um, you can, you're going to get to practice throughout the assignments um, to get better at them doing the So if you're not, if you can't do them in seconds right now, don't worry about it, but practice them. The assignments are going to help you get better at it, and you need to be able to do it somewhat quickly by the time we get to the exam because there's a time limit on the exam. So structures one, we're going to learn how we create the system. We're going to pick our preliminary design, so our preliminary sizes, how deep does our preliminary floor need to be. We're going to figure out all the loads on the building. We're going to figure out how those loads trace through the building. And then we're going to look at each object in the building and figure out what its loading is and how strong it needs to be. Structures two is we're going to pick the members that are strong enough. That sounds nice and easy. All of this work in Structures 1 and this itty bitty little thing in Structures 2. But Structures 2 is where all the concepts come together and allow you to pick the perfectly sized member. So we will have the cheapest member that we can possibly get that does all the jobs we need to do. Cheap does not mean bad. Cheap does not even mean ugly. Cheap means once we've taken in all the constraints we have, 
that we have the best member we can possibly pick to do this job for us. And if everything else works, we want the cheapest one because we don't want to have to pay more than we need to. So what we're going to do in today's lecture, um, it's what is structure? And then we're going to do strength, stiffness, and stability. And we're going to throw in some basic math in there as well. So we're going to talk about what structural engineering is. Uh, we're going to look at structure as part of the design process. Basically, where does it fit in the hierarchy of the design? Um, we're going to review some basic math. And then we're going to talk about strength, stiffness, and stability. So structural engineering. A field of engineering dealing with analysis and design that supports or resists loads. Basically, we want something that is strong enough, stiff enough, and stable to hold our building up. Uh, structural engineering. Our goal is to design a safe, safe, stable building that is the cheapest possible while meeting the constraints, needs, demands of the client. So we want to make sure no lives are ever lost during its lifetime. We want to make sure that all of the finishes don't crack and fall off. And we want to make sure the owner isn't paying way more than they have to to get that building. Structural engineering in Canada, we designed to meet part four of the NBCC. So that's the National Building Code of Canada. Part four is the structural portion of the code. The architectural part is part three. You guys have probably all looked at it, probably all talked about it. <coughs> we also have any provincial and municipal requirements. We have to be aware of those as well. For example, climatic data, which is how much snow falls in a particular region, is published in the NBCC. I recently did a project where I looked up the snow load for that region did all my calculations on it, we submitted for permit, and the building department called me and they said, oh, you didn't know that in this one spot, in this one region, we have a specialty snow load. Um, so you have to go back and redo everything because, um, and there's, it's not really, you'd have to go on the website, it was hard to find. I went out of my way then to find where I could have possibly known that information. Seems like, unless I called them, there was no way to know. And that's not normally something we do, is call the local municipality. Um, so engineers will communicate this stuff. Um, I reached out to a few other engineers and we shared that information. So we have it now in our own little database that flags it, that if I go to look that up, I know this municipality has some weird spots that aren't published in the normal publications. It doesn't matter that it was difficult to find. I needed to know it. So this is less something I would test you on. Um, this is more just um, a where does it all fit in the design process? Like how do, we des how do we define this process? So everything we ever do starts with defining a problem and solving a problem. It's hard to solve the problem without having defined the, pro defined the problem. You can end up with really horrible solutions that way. Or you end up finding problems. Maybe they're not problems you actually have and you just want to make use of your solution. Um, the idea here is that we have um, who defines the problem and who solves the problem. So for you guys, the owner is defining the problem. I need a community center that has a pool and a rink and a bocce court uh, outside, um, uh, but we're in a dense region, so it needs to be stacked because our footprint is small and we live in a high hurricane zone. They're not making a problem, they're defining the problem for you. You, as the architect, designs that building for them. You then say, I have a uh, wood structure with these spans to span over the pool and the rink, um, and I need this surface outside for the bocce court, but it's over a subway, and um, we're stacking this building, um, and that's defining the structural problems, and the engineer provides the solutions. I go and say, okay, well, that means we have this snow load and this live load and these wind loads. 
Um, we need these members that are this thick and this long, um, and we need the connections to be this strong. And that is me now defining a problem that a contractor solves. The contractor says, okay, I will find this petite piece of material, hire someone to connect it together to meet those loads, and their problem solution is actually building the building. Um, I like rules, I like steps, I like a process. Again, this isn't something to test you on, it's just to start thinking about the methodology here. Step one, understand your precedents. If you understand your precedent and it meets your needs, there is no reason you should go further. Um, you can go further, that's not what I'm trying to say. It, it's that if the precedent works to solve your problem, you have a good solution. Because precedent means it has gone through the process of being validated for problem solution on the architectural, structural, and contractor side. Meaning that it was probably the cheapest, safest method to build that building. Your building will be different, the design still has to happen, but you're starting that step one with a good solution in mind. If, so say you were designing a hockey rink, um, and you looked at a bunch of hockey rinks and saw most of them are big, wide flan be beams that um, taper down to these columns that taper down like this, and down the long side, there's steel bracing in a few bays. For those that are interested, that's a butler building or a Balin building style uh, construction. If there was no reason not to, that is a really good, cheap solution. But maybe the client has said, we need, um, we need um, wood ceilings uh, in our building, or because we're stacking it, we have a new refine as appropriate issue that we have to solve. We've looked at the precedent and said, okay, normally we would do something similar, but we have this constraint in this portion of the building. So then we refine as appropriate. We take the precedent and tweak it. Maybe we need to do this to it. Maybe we need to just massage this area over here. But then if that doesn't work to solve our problem, that's when we start to innovate. We're uniquely in a point in structural engineering with wood design, for example, for mass timber where it's all innovation. Um, Dave and I have given some uh, lectures together where we basically refer, refer to it as the Wild West of engineering right now. There are no precedents. Everything everyone is doing is innovating and eventually the best ones will start to shake out and we will start to develop precedents. But right now we have to do a whole bunch of different ways to find the precedent. Um, and then the precedent will be the one out of all of those ways that was the cheapest, easiest, smartest way to design those buildings, and they'll become the precedent for future generations of designing that type of building. All right, let's make it a little bit more in depth here. The first step, the architect selects the system and figures out the building and layout. So, you know, I'm going to have a door over here, I'm going to use this footprint of my building, I'm going to have walls along here and windows along here. I can have an elevator in the middle. Then you're going to probably, by yourself, do a sizing guideline or give preliminary members to the client using rules of thumb. Rules of thumb are quick estimates of what size members you will need. All of the fields of engineering and even fields of architecture have rules of thumb. Um, so I, we're going to do a whole lecture talking about those later on in the term, um, where you will then have the ability to look at a set of plans and apply um, sizing guidelines to them to figure out approximately how deep they want to be. Remember. You don't want to find out you needed a deeper member than you guessed because then you're going to have problems with your ceiling depths. Um, and that's when then you probably go back to the client. You guys would design a, decide as a team that the project was going to go ahead. That's when the engineer gets involved. The engineer figures out what loads acts on, act on the building. Um, 
The, en the architect might be involved here, and here's why. Most of it is the engineer's responsibility, but we have to know when something unusual is happening. If we don't know it's there, we can't solve the problem. You have to define the problem for us. Um, a good example, and you'll see I'll do this sometimes, I'm going to draw you a little picture that I'm going to hold up to the camera. Normally what I would do is I would have um, a touch screen computer that I spent a ridiculous amount of money on years ago um, so that I could draw these things right on the screen for you. It's, I can still do it, but it's just super awkward. I'm like leaning over way over here because my computer's doing like three separate things right now. So gold ring, for example, gold ring, ah, I drew one too many floors, but that's okay. Gold ring Gold ring. Truss up high, floors hung from the underside of the bottom core, big opening under here. Normally, not that big a deal, right? This is an MRI machine. Most MRI machines come with a clause that they need to be in a basement or on a slab on grade to limit vibration to the object, to the MRI. MRIs are magnetic resonance imaging, resonance imaging. Basically, they're highly susceptible to vibration. Um, they use magnets um, to uh, help develop the images. So you could imagine movement of any sort could um, uh, interfere with that process. Normally, these would go in the basement, but floor plan um, meant that this had to go up on the fourth floor. Big challenge already. That person there is lifting weights we had an Olympic weightlifting floor zone. If you guys don't know what that is, it's when um, the weightlifters, man or woman, lift up those big ones, hold them up over their head for a very brief time and then throw it down on the floor. Boom! Everything shakes a little bit. These hangers that the floor is hung from transfer vibration upstairs very easily. So we had a very unique problem we had to solve. Just in case anyone's interested, we ended up doing something really cool. We isolated the floor. So we made sure that the floor was disconnected and these are springs in here, essentially. So we disconnected the floors from each other. We put a stronger floor underneath, then with hydraulic jacks, separated them and put vibration isolators in there, and then had the Olympic weightlifting floor on it. In 2017, um, at the TSA party, um, I was giving a tour of uh, of the building and there was some people working out at the Olympic weightlifting floor. And we said, keep going, keep doing your thing. And we had half of the people doing the tour stand on one side and half on the other. And when they threw the weights down, everybody on the Olympic weightlifting floor side could feel the vibration and all of us on the other side felt nothing at all. So we were able to limit those, um, those vibrations from going back up through the hangers into the floor that the, the uh, MRI was on. But I wouldn't have known that if the architect hadn't gone out of the way to let us know that we had a special load constraint because of that MRI. If I just saw a floor plan that said lab, that would have been the end of it. But because it was an MRI, we communicated on that and solved that problem. Step four, 
Once the engineer knows the loads, they figure out what it does to every member, every connection, and every system in the building. Um, then the engineer, with input from the architect, what members are stable, strong enough, and stiff enough to meet all those loads. This is the majority of what we're going to do this term. This is the majority of what we're going to do next year. I have, it's not next term, it's next year for you guys. And then, once we've figured out what those members are, maybe a few of them don't fit, or we have to tweak a floor plan, or make some changes, we have to go back and go through the whole process again. So you, as an architect, need to know how to pick the best system, that means the cheapest and the smallest, the best layout, and the approximate sizes, or the guidelines. So not the best member, it's my job to pick the best member, you need to be able to pick the approximate member. Next term, or next year, you will learn how to pick the best member. That's not what you're going to do throughout your whole career, but you do need an understanding of where it comes from on my side. It will help you down the road pick the best approximate size. So, here are your secret weapons. Cool precedence. Engineers get exposed to nothing. We see no cool buildings. We see the most boring, lamest, simplest, well, maybe not simplest, often quite difficult, um, buildings that we do when we're learning in school. Um, and then after that, we're only exposed to the architecture that we work on. I've been really lucky in my life that I've been exposed to more than most. Um, I've had a really privileged, I've been really privileged in my career that I got lucky early on and got to work with some really great teams that then led to working with more great teams. Um, so I probably have more exposure than most. That said, you're going to come to me and be like, oh, you know this project in Barcelona with blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to be like, I do not know what you're talking about because we're not exposed to it. You guys are. You guys have the ability to say to an engineer, there is this cool project. It works like this, I think. I want to try to do something like this. Can you try to help us understand how it works? The other thing you have is the sizing guidelines. Engineers start off with the sizing guidelines too, and then we learn all the math. And once you know the math, it's this funny thing that we forget how to go back to the basics. So you will always have those basics, and you'll be sitting in a meeting with an engineer, and you'll say, roughly what size do we need here? And the engineer is going to start to do all kinds of math and calculations, and you're going to pull out your sizing guideline, look how long it is, divide it by a number, and say, what about this deep? They're going to spend an hour doing a calculation and tell you that you're pretty darn close to right. I just want to go back to this, and I should have a whole slide in here about it. Everything you need to know about engineering, you already know. You intuitively have an incredible, hey, do you think you'd make me a coffee? Um, no? Yeah, I didn't know where the squishy are. Uh, bottom. There's no squishies. There's no squishy juice, is there? Oh, bottom drawer then. Um, uh, everything you need to know about engineering you already know. You have an amazing, intuitive understanding of structural engineering. Um, if somebody, if you're standing upright and someone pushes you over, you open your feet to stop yourself from tipping over. When you're going skiing down a hill, you know to tuck your body up to lower your center of gravity. You understand equilibrium, you understand moment, you understand forces. I am going to spend the next ter two terms um, mathematically representing your understanding, and it's like the second I show you a number, people forget their intuition. So what I want you to get in the habit of, before you ever do a calculation on any problem we ever talk about, don't look at the numbers, write what you think is going to happen up in the top corner of your page, or in the back corner of your mind, but think about it before you put a number to paper. Then, go through and do all your calculations, and compare the two. See if they check out, because guaranteed your intuition is pretty darn good, and if the numbers don't match your intuition, you've probably done something wrong. I've been, I keep meaning to make a series of videos of my kids. 
when they play with Lego and they build something and it tips over because they hung it too far off the side or they did this, the next time they build it, they don't do that thing. Um, and I see architects draw things that aren't stable and don't work. That if you were building it with Lego, you would intuitively understand it didn't work. Um, if you're going to waste money, on, not waste money, if you're going to spend money on something for structural engineering or practicing, um, buy some Lego. It is shockingly helpful in um, understanding cantilevers and moments and equilibriums. You will find it helps give you an understanding of things. I can't tell you how to build it or what to do with it, but you might just find it helpful for yourself. All right. Arachnophobia. It is the fear of math. There are some of you that are going to have it. Um, we can't get away from it. We're going to be doing math in this course. I'm going to try to make it as painless as possible. That's why I've added these slides. The first couple years I taught, we just jumped into this stuff and people were taken aback. Um, so this gives you a week or two to kind of help get yourself into it. So the things that you're going to need to know, you're going to want a scientific calculator. Um, yes, I know that your phone, your phone, if you turn it sideways, well, apparently not my phone. I must have my screen locked. Is it going to do it now? Yeah. It turns into a scientific calculator. There is something about the iPhone that I, I type things in and I retype it in five times. I find it the worst. It is worth the $13.99 on Amazon or go into state, well, I guess nobody can go anywhere. Um, but get your hands on a calculator, a scientific calculator. The, this was, this might have even been $9.99. Okay, it, it's a cheap, cheap thing, but it is worth, oh, you did make me a coffee. You're the best. Thank you. Um, can you reply to Dan and Jen and let them know we can do a, an outdoor visit at their place this afternoon? Yeah, why not? What time do you want me to do? Two. Okay. Um, could I get groceries tomorrow? No, you're panicked, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -mm. We'll figure it out. Um, it's the challenge of isolation with two small kids. They need exposure. We need to be outside, obviously. There's only ten outside. Um, I'm just trying to give them what they need without doing the wrong thing. Um, what's more infor important, fresh milk or an outdoor play in a forest field farm with animals? Thinking the farm with the animals is more important. Um, okay, you need to know how to use a calculator. Exponents, Square, square root, cube, cube root. You should know your basic trig functions and Pythagorean theorem. Uh, you should know how to look things up on a chart. Uh, you should know how to look things up on a graph. If the data you need is in between any of those two points, you need to know how to interpolate. You should know how to solve for x, which means um, plugging everything in on one side of equations. You should know how to rearrange an equation. So if the thing you're looking for is in the middle, how do you rearrange and make it equal to everything else? If x is in the middle there, how do you rearrange things? How do you put two or more equations together? How do you do that stuff? And so that, most of that stuff is junior high, grade 10 math. That said, some of you haven't done math in a really, really long time. Um, I know for most of you, this is a second degree. Um, and maybe you did something um, less in the mathematical side. Um, uh, if so, and maybe in high school math wasn't your strongest, it could, it could have been five, six years since some of you have done a math course. Um, some of you might be in your 30s or 40s or even 50s or 60s, um, and it could have been a very long time since you've done some math. If so, try to familiarize yourself with these concepts. I've tried to write it in a way that if you need more than what we're going to do quickly right now, you can search it on the internet that maybe it'll give you some extra kind of help. 
Um, you should also know how to convert units of basic things. All right, exponents, pretty easy. I'm not gonna do any of the math for this one because it's pretty easy, I'm just gonna talk it through. Normally I would turn my camera down um, and do all of the math questions kind of at once and then intersperse it throughout the uh, lecture. It doesn't seem like we'd need that for this, so this one's gonna be, you're just gonna have to look at my mug for the rest of this lecture. Um, so um, we have our base and our exponent. The base is the lower number and the exponent is the upper number. So five squared is really five times five. So it's how many times you're multiplying a number by itself. Five to the power of four, or exponent four, is five times five times five times five. Or five multiplied against itself four times, is 625. If we don't know what we're using, we might use placeholders for both of these that we can look up somewhere else. So that's telling us until we hit the number n, whatever n is given to us to be. Roots are the opposite of exponents. We're not gonna get into complex numbers or imaginary numbers or anything like that, so don't worry about that for those of you who I know were just dying to ask the question. Um, uh, what we have here is we're saying how many times we would have needed to multiply a number against itself to get that number. So um, the fourth root of 625, well, what number multiplied against itself four times gives us 625? Well, in our case, that's five. For a calculator, now everybody's calculator is different. I can't tell you what order yours does. Mine is the type that when I turn it on, I need to type 4, then second function, x root, and then I can type 625 and equal. Some calculators do it in a slightly different order, so play around with your calculator. Plug these things in and get good at knowing your calculator. I have the Sharp brand. I think it's the Casio that does it in the other order. I've had that kind in the past. Now that I've lost that one years ago, this is the only way I can do it, and if you ask me to use the other type of calculator, it would take me twice as long to do anything. So get used to your calculator. So here's a close-up of my calculator. You can see the buttons that I would have used, and you can see some of them are second function. Scientific notation, or base 10 exponents. That is telling us how many times we would need to move the zero, or how many times we would need to multiply something by 10 to give us the number. The reason we do it is if numbers are really big or really small, because even a really small number looks really large because we have all the zeros in front of it, it's a pain in the butt to write. So we will often um, write the smaller version of it and then it capture all of those zeros with um, a base 10 exponent. So 5 times 10 to the 3 is 5,000 because we have moved our decimal place three times. 1, 2, 3, giving us, giving us 5,000. 5 to the te, to, um, times 10 to the 12, we've moved it 12 times. Um, 5 times 10 to the minus 4, We've moved it four times. Are they okay in there? Really? Okay. Um, calculators and Excel will often represent this times 10 with an E. That is telling us that we did a base 10 exponent. So it's just another way to write it. You'll see probably answers of mine in Quercus going forward that might show an E in the math problem. What that is representing is this. If you want to do something in Excel, maybe open it up, try these things in Excel as well, compare it to your calculator. With scientific notation, we often incorporate significant figures. Significant figures is the digits that carry meaning. Um, so, 5.2 pounds has two significant figures. 1.54 times 10 to the 4 has three significant figures. 1, 2, 3. 
this 1,100 kilograms, it's not clear. Um, typically, if we added a decimal place here, that is saying that we have four significant figures, and this would be two. But if this had been a one and a one, we would have had four significant figures. So this could be, there's at least two, it could be three or four. In this course, I'm typically going to get you to keep three or four significant figures. In, um, in Quercus, because it's a bit of pain in the butt, I am always going to tell you, um, if not significant figures, how many numbers past the decimal I want you to keep in mathematical problems. So I will give you that information, try to pay attention to it. Um, if one of those, if that last one is a zero, when you go to enter your, your answer, it disappears. It's still recognizing that it's there. It's just taken the fact that it's a zero and erased it from your number. Don't worry if that number is a zero. Um, so exa for example, if I told you to write something to one decimal place and the answer was 5.0, it would drop the zero when you go to submit it. It kept the zero, you're not losing marks because it doesn't have the right amount of significant figures. So scientific notation, you can see this button right here gives us our scientific notation. Um, that also does it as well, 10 to the power of. Um, so math, let's look at some of our triangles, triangles, right angle triangles explicitly. I always say if it's not a right angle, it's a wrong angle. So. Right angle triangles are very, very helpful for us. We are going to do a lot. Is Duncan wearing a diaper? Um, did he just say he pooped? He's playing a dangerous game. <laughs> he peed his pants. Did you poop too, Duncan? Okay, right angle triangle. Right angle triangle is where the triangle has a 90 degrees. The angle we're talking about for the triangle is whatever one we've designated. The opposite side of the triangle is the one opposite the angle we're talking about. The adjacent side is the one beside the angle we're talking about. And the hypotenuse is the long side, or the one opposite our right angle. If I deleted this and started talking about this angle here, this side would be opposite and this side would be adjacent. The first thing we're going to talk about is Pythagorean's theory. Pythagorean's theory says that in a right angle triangle, we have the opposite, adjacent, hypotenuse. There's not really, that's a, this could be a and B and C. Often they do it that way. I've just had this figure drawn once. Opposite and adjacent make no difference in Pythagorean's theorem, but the two short sides squared and added up is the equivalent of the long side squared, or the sum of this side squared and this side squared equals this side squared. So we can rearrange that if we want to know what this length is, and we know these two lengths, it's the square root of h squared minus a squared. If we want to know what h is, it's the square root of a squared plus o squared. Sakatoa, or the sine cosine tangent rule. In a right angle, opposite, adjacent, hypotenuse, angle of interest, the sine of the angle equals the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. The cosine of the angle equals the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. And the tangent of the angle equals opposite over adjacent. This is really handy. If we know one side in an angle, we can figure out the other two sides. We can rearrange this to find out what the angle is if we want. Um, so let's use sine, let's just use the sine one. We know the sine of the angle equals opposite over hypotenuse, but that doesn't really give us any answers. We can rearrange to find the opposite side if we know the hypotenuse and the angle. We can rearrange to find the hypotenuse if we know the opposite side and the angle. 
Or we can find the angle if we know the opposite side and the hypotenuse. And for that, we use the arc sine function, or sine to the negative 1. And that is usually a second function of your sine cosine tangent buttons. And I'll show you a picture of that in the slides here. Hot tip, make sure your calculator is in degrees. Um, there is a tendency for people to forget and put their calculator in radians and end up with the wrong answer. So here's just a quick example for you. Um, feel free to go through and practice these, where if we knew these elements, what are the other two elements? Definitely practice these. Give them a try. Okay, um, a graph, which seems silly. You know how to look something up on a graph, right? Well, what if the length we want to know is 5.4 meters? We've got 4 meters here and 6 meters here, and we want to know the weight. Well, we can come along here to 5.4. We can find where 5.4 is roughly. That would be about 5. So it looks like 5.4 should be right there. We can draw the line over. It looks like pretty darn close to 30 is the right answer for this. It's not exact, but it's an interpolation really between these two points here. Now this is the thing. Interpolation, which is the next thing we're going to do, seems so exact, but it is still just an approximation of between those two points. But it's a slightly more precise approximation than drawing it on a graph. It's slightly more precise in its inaccuracy. <laughs> All right, so what if we had this chart and we wanted to know what 5.4 is? They've given us that 5 is 25 kilograms and 6 meters is 36 kilograms. Look at this. That's exactly what this chart was here. So looking at our, ch our graph, we know that it's probably an answer around 30. Well, let's look. We have something somewhere between 5 and 6, so it's an answer somewhere between 25 and 36. If you did all this, if you did what we're about to do and you got an answer of 50, well, you know you should be probably wrong. So over here, I'd just take the time to write for myself something between 25 and 36 maybe closer to 25 than 36, because 5.4 is closer to 5 than 6. So that would be my guess, somewhere between 25 and 36, but closer to the 25 side. So we need to figure out, so we know that the difference between 36 and 25 is 11, and the difference between 5 and 6 is 1. We know that the difference between 5 and 5.4 is 0.4, so we can figure out what ratio that is and then add back our 25. Or 36 minus 25 is 11. 6 minus 5 is 1. Divide those out as similar triangles. 5.4 minus 5 is 0.4. Multiply it by that to find out what percentage is the 5.4. And then add back our 25. And we calculate that out and we get 29.4 kilograms. I find interpolation always sounds so crazy or um, when you're telling someone else the steps to do. If you just stop and intuitively do it, in fact, I find it very helpful to almost draw this part of our triangle right here. What we're saying is from here to here is 1 and here to here is 11. We're right here. So from here to here is 0.4, and what we want to know is what this distance is. So we have 11 divided by 1 times 0.4, which is exactly that calculation we just did, but then we have to add back in our 25 because we actually started from here, not right here. And we very, cal very precisely calculate our imprecise answer of 29.4 kilograms pretty darn close to our 30 kilograms, which was what we found when we looked at it on the, on the graph, and that matches our estimate of something between 25 and 36, but closer to the 25 than 36. So this looks pretty good. So here
here it is worked out step by step. Here it is where I've even drawn a little triangle for you. Some people find similar triangles very helpful in determining this stuff. Units that you need to know in this course. Length, a thousand millimeters equals a meter. One inch equals 25.4 millimeters. 12 inches equals one foot. Force and mass, one kilonewton, which is what we're gonna use a lot in this course, is a thousand newtons, which also equals um, 102.06 kilograms, which also equals 224.8085 pounds, but we'll round out to 225 pounds quite often when we talk about things. Pressure, one MPA is one newton per millimeter squared. One MPA is a thousand KPA. One KPA is a thousand kilonewtons per meter squared. And a moment we're gonna talk about later in this term, one kilonewton meter equals one million newton millimeters. Okay, let's do today's lecture. This is more um, how to help start thinking about structures because really what we need to do is make sure everything we look at in a building is strong enough and stiff enough and stable. And again, stability for sure, you intuitively know, and strength and stiffness, you probably have a surprisingly good gut feel for. When you look at something and it looks wrong, you tend to know it. Um, so strength is the amount of load a structure can sustain prior to failure. So this is all about loss of life. Is this thing safe? Is this thing going to kill people and fall apart and break? Or no, not fall apart. Is this thing going to break and then fall apart? Stability is, is it going to fall apart and then break? Stiffness is slightly different. Stiffness isn't about loss of life. Stiffness is all about finishes and the comfort of people. So it's the amount of force required to make a structure deflect, deflect by some fixed increment. Basically, what we need to do is make sure things are stiff enough. We don't want people to feel like a floor is moving. We don't want all of our drywall finishes to break. We don't want glass to bust in a windstorm because our building is moving. It is separate from strength. A building could be strong enough to move, but if it busts the windows, it's not stiff enough, even though it was strong enough. Stability is, is this thing gonna stand up? You intuitively know that that, oops, that that's not stable. If I hold this here like this, you know that it is stable. So we have a great intuitive understanding of stability and most of the time it's more or less a check in the box for us, but we are gonna have to draw illustrations later in the term that basically illustrates stability of a building for us. Um, and then we have to do this for every connection, every element, and every system in a building. So strength, stiffness, st stability, every element, every connection, every system in a building. A long time ago, we used to do something called factor of safety design. So let's say, I don't have a table here in front of me. I used to look at a table. I wonder if, all right. This table here, if I climbed on top of it, we know that this table has its own self weight and the weight of Shannon on the table. We want that table to be strong enough to hold me and the table's self-weight. So that's its capacity. So it needs to be strong enough to hold the load on the system. Me and the table are the load on the system. What happens if I go out and have a burger and beer for lunch? When I come back, if this table was only just strong enough to hold me and the self-weight of the table, the additional load of the burger and the beer in my tummy is going to fail this table. So obviously we don't want that. How do we know the exact weight of every person that's gonna sit on that table? We need to put something called a factor of safety on it, or this is what they used to do. 
and they said, all right, we don't know how many burgers and beers Shannon's going to go have. We're going to put a factor of safety on that. We're going to figure out what the load is, multiply it by this number, and depending on the type of thing it was, it was a different number. Um, connections were usually five. Um, uh, members were usually three or four. Soil would be two or three. And then we would make sure the table was strong enough to hold that. So the table being an object, the factor of safety might have been three or four, so let's say four. We would say we want that table to be strong enough to hold four Shannons, and, and four Shannons and four table weights. Or maybe we would add up Shannon and the table and multiply it by four, and we needed something strong enough to hold that. The problem there is that the variety in the table isn't going to be that much. The table might be um, a heavier wood, but there's not that much variability in the weight of the wood that we're going to put there. We're defining um, how much um, or how thick that table is. Maybe they planed it a little bit thicker, but it's not going to be four times the amount of wood to make that table. That just wouldn't be economical. That would be crazy. So maybe we don't need to multiply the wood by the same amount. Um, and um, Shannon going out for a burger and beer is a lot different than Shannon finding three other Shannons to come hang out and sit on the table with. So as much as it makes sense that we would multiply the weight of Shannon by something more, four Shannons might be a bit much in the world. So instead, you be quiet. <laughs> terrified by that thought. Don't worry, I get him back with various images throughout this course. Um, um, <clears throat> we, um, we don't maybe think it's fair to multiply Shannon by four Shannons. That seems a bit much. It's doubtful that I'd go eat that many burgers and beers. But the thing that this doesn't address is, <clears throat> what if that wood had a big knot in the middle of it? Or what if the day they were making the table, they planed it too thin, and it wasn't as strong as we expected it to be? <clears throat> so really smart people designing things all over the world went back and changed the way they designed things. They said, let's look at each type of load and increase the load by some amount that is appropriate for that load type. And then let's look at the capacity and assume it's less than what we have. So if we have a, a table that is two inches thick, let's maybe assume we have a table that's slightly less thick. Or we know our table wood is this strong. Let's assume it's a little bit less strong than that. And now let's make sure our capacity is greater than our loads. Or let's make sure our decreased capacity is greater than our increased loads. We like to name things. So let's make sure our reduced capacity is greater than the factored load. We like to give things symbols. So here are some symbols for a factor and a reduction. And sometimes even that's not enough. What if we write down what the actual load is on a piece of paper? How would somebody know it was factored or not? Well, if we put this little subscript F, we are telling someone else we have already applied these load factors. If we put a little subscript R, that means we have already applied this reduction to the capacity. And that's important because it tells us what stage we are in the design process of that element. So subscript F, factored, subscript R, reduced. This is called limit state design. And that is how most things in Canada and in the world are done now. We used to do factor of safety, we do not now. For whatever reason, inevitably, in spite of me saying this and writing it, I will ask people what method of design do we do now, and people will choose factor of safety. And it is not what we do now, I can't stress that enough. The last holdout was foundations, we designed um, soil design, um, anything geotechnical using factor of safety, but that switched in 2003, 2004, would you say? Something like that, yeah. yeah. So when I started my career, we still used factor of safety only for soil design. 
um, limit state design was everything else, but now even soils, everything is limit state design. Some weird published things in the states for some connectors might just not have updated their material data, having done a um, uh, 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 factor of safety method, but you can usually convert that to a limit state design method. Okay, so what are the load types for strength that we're going to be talking about through this term? We're going to talk about compression when we squash something and tension when we stretch it. We're going to talk about shear. Shear Fs with people's heads. Shear is what is happening on the singular plane in an object as we try to shift two sides past each other. So what is happening directly on that plane as we try to shift the two things? This image is showing a plane, and then a plane, and then a plane, and a plane, and a plane, and a plane, an infinite amount of planes added up beside each other where I'm shifting them like that. So if you add up a bunch of those, you start to skew your object. And look, we've started to stretch that side out, and we've started to squash that side in. It's almost like we've managed to put tension there and compression there. Ooh, they seem happy to come here. Would, could they, would that be better? Probably. Because then we can have a fire in the backyard and we can roast hot dogs if we need to. You cool with that? Yeah. yeah, that would make my life easier rather than having to drive to Rice Lake. Um, bending, keep my weird little foam block here. Used to get lots of looks traveling on the subway with this. I mean, lots of crazy looks. People thought I was nuts. So here is my handy little foam block to demonstrate things. I am going to bend this. Now, here's what I love about this. Look at the top right here. It got shorter. And this right here, it got longer. It puts compression on one side and tension on the other. It looks like it all comes back to tension and compression in the end. Whatever force we're talking about, Ultimately, it tends to come back to tension and compression, but bending puts compression on one side and tension on the other. Look, if I bend it the other way, I get my tension on the top and my compression on the bottom. Look at this middle line. Seems like not much happens to it. That's going to be handy later on in the, the next term or next, some, next year for you guys, but it will, we will talk about it a little bit. Torsion, we're not really going to talk about torsion this term, um, but it's helpful to know it's there. I find it a funny little combination of both shear and moment. Um, uh, we've got um, torque is twisting it, so we've got planes of things happening, but we are applying moment. Um, strength, we need to worry about connections and objects. Um, Ductile or brittle combinations of axial shear, bending, and torsion on local elements. Um, let's, so that was just, I wanted to highlight that we also worry about connections. The best way to kind of show all of these concepts is to show failures. Um, first off, they're the fun things to look, about, look at, <clears throat> and it helps us kind of talk about these things. Mostly, this lecture is looking at some images. Um, you're going to do some math that explores those math concepts that we did in the assignment. Um, but I want you to be thinking about what types of failures things are. One of the funny things about strength, stiffness, and stability is that one can trigger the other. If something fails in strength, it often triggers a stability failure. If something fails in stability, it can often trigger a strength failure. If something fails in deflection, it can sometimes lead to a stability failure, which then leads to a strength failure. So it's not always obvious, and I've actually given you, um, uh, if um, uh, if I've given you a question, sometimes it's not always obvious. So the question I've given you on the assignment, the very last one, I'm not making you. It's not being marked. I want you to just think about it as a process. Give yourself the act of thinking about what type of failure you have. 
I find that's a really fun exercise, but it doesn't seem fair to mark you on that. So just take that as a really good thought process. Write your answers down somewhere. You don't have to share them with anyone. You're not <coughs> submitting them to me. Um, well, it would have been fun to make that an unmarked poll. That's, it's, it's up. It would have been fun to see what people selected. Maybe I might. I might go back and do that and try to assign it a zero point value just to see if we can make that work. Because that would be kind of fun to make you pick what type of failure you think you're seeing there. Um, so, sorry, I then didn't even talk about this slide. So here is axial failures in compression. These things have been squashed until they actually ruptured out the side. Here, this steel piece has been stretched until it's failed. Um, next term, we'll actually watch a video of them failing this object. Shear. I find shear easy for people to understand when it is two washers with a steel bolt slipping past each other. You can understand that this is a shear plane right here. Now, if you could cut away these pieces here, the bolt inside there, which failed due to this shear plane, is skewed I can't tell what way you're seeing this, skewed like this. Um, and if you look at this failure here of this concrete beam in shear, it's the same tilted angle. Imagine we have a shear plane beside a shear plane beside a shear plane beside the shear plane beside a shear plane. Any of you that study math know that that is really the principle behind calculus. And calculus is really the way we analyze these things. Although we've done it so much for so many of things that we've figured out how to shorten it down into shorter, easier ways to analyze these things. But what we're essentially looking at here is a series of shear planes that develop a crack along it. And if you remember in that skewed um, box that we did for shear, we had one side stretching and one side compressing. And this is basically following um, our stretching line, popping it apart. Shear failures for two different walls. Now, normally when I'm in person, I ask people what type of event do they think caused these two things. Lateral loads are the things that push buildings sideways and fail shear walls. Wind and earthquake are typically the things. And so I often ask people which one they think is a wind failure and which one they think is an earthquake failure. This one is the wind failure because in a wind storm, you don't often have a quick reversal of load. I get it, if you were in a tornado, that could happen. Um, even a hurricane, but the odds of it being the same force in both directions, enough to fail it right after each other in sim like almost quick succession is unlikely. This, earthquakes do throw things back and forth right after each other. That's how an earthquake works. It doesn't just go to one side. It throws it this way, then it immediately throws it this way. And that's why earthquake design is so dangerous. Or not designing for earthquakes is so dangerous because you can see that this failed like this. So it failed in both directions. As much as this failed, there's probably reinforcing in here that allowed this to stay stable and do the job it needed to do. In Haiti, um, with all the loss of life in 2006, 2007, I believe, um, there wasn't much reinforcing in these types of walls and the shear failures um, from the earthquake caused the, the top and bottom floor to slip past each other and then pancake down, causing astronomical catastrophic loss of life. As those two floors, those two planes, you can imagine if this one's stable, this one's shearing past, and if the wall doesn't resist it, it would tip right off the wall and then pancake. Another type of shear failure, Concrete, this is the most common type of concrete failure um, for slabs. This is um, why in parking garages we have capitals and drop panels, and we're gonna talk about that later in the term. Our slab, as we load it, wants to have the um, columns basically go right up through it. Imagine taking a piece of styrofoam and supporting it on popsicles, or on um, toothpicks. 
if you pushed down on it, the toothpicks would go right through the styrofoam and you'd be able to push that down right to the ground. The ideas of columns and capitals, which are these bits right here, take that toothpick and glue a little flat panel on it and now put your styrofoam on top of it. It's not going to punch through the styrofoam. So this is a concrete punching shear where the slab actually slid down in a plane around our columns. Here is a bending failure. We have a support here and a support here and something pushing down, I'll use my chin, pushing down as a load here. You can see we get a bending failure. It's the same thing as if I had done this or curved my fingers like this. We get compression on the top and tension on the bottom. This one, it's the same thing happening. What you can't see off camera is that there's a support here and a support here. And, well, you guys can't see what I'm pointing. These two um, things are the applied load. So it's essentially, oops, it's essentially doing this, where we've got tension on the top and compression. Like your hot shot. <laughs> <laughs> what movie is that? The Cole Kidman and Tom Cruise. <laughs> I like your hat, Shannon. No, it was a love story. I can't remember. Anyway, I like your hat, Shannon. Um, uh, curves it like this, where we've got tension on the top and compression on the bottom. So it's still bending. It just depends what way we're bending it, which side has the tension, and which has the compression. Um, you can see that if you bend something far enough, this didn't actually break apart, but it's certainly not stiff enough anymore, or it's not stable anymore. This was on a support. It would have fallen right off of the supports. Torsion, twisting it, you can see that it's got some weird combination of a shear and bending failure. Um, uh, you can see it's got that funny angle thing happening, but there's also a tension and compression element that's hard to show in this diagram, but I'm telling you for sure that it's there. We're not going to deal with torsion in the, in the next two courses, um, but it is nice to hear the word and know that it is a little bit sheer, a little bit bending moment. Not a little bit Alexa. Um, Torsion failure, here's just a fantastically massive torsion failure. That's the easiest one to find pictures for. So here's a connection um, failed in, in shear. Something shifted it relative to each other. Here is a shear failure for bolts. Often when they install steel, they'll just tack a few um, bolts in temporarily while, because it's expensive to have the crane there holding it in place. They'll put two bolts in quickly and then move on to the next one. And then later somebody comes back and puts in all the bolts. If that doesn't happen and you build the rest of the building, you don't have a connection that is strong enough to support the loads anymore. And in this case, the bolts failed in shear. Here is a connection failure for plate intention. This is not that common, um, maybe part of a bracing or maybe even part of a testing system, but you can see they've actually managed to pull that apart. Here is a moment failure that's turned into a tension failure. So if I want to tip this over, and I've just got a support here like this, it's going to tip right over. If I hold this, and I wish I don't know, can I get you guys to see this. If I hold this at the base like this and try to push it over, I need to hold this side down and this side wants to squish. So for this side to be held down, I could clamp it, maybe I'd thread something through it all the way down. What we do in construction is we put anchor bolts. So these anchors went down into the concrete, but obviously they weren't designed for that pull-out force and they actually ripped up out of the ground. One thing we can do is weld big things on the bottom and make that distance between these two anchors 
bigger. That's the same thing as if you were standing like this. Actually, maybe I can actually even do it. Can you see me back here? If I move my chair. Hey, Dave, push me. Push me on my shoulder. Okay, wait, do it again. I have created a couple with my feet. I haven't glued my feet to the floor. You didn't see me glue my feet. I'm wearing my same slipper Uggs that I was in the first time Dave pushed me, but all of a sudden I didn't tip over. It's because I took the distance between the loads resisting the force and spread them out. And that gave me the ability to deal with the fact that it wanted to tip over. That concept's gonna be super exciting later in the term. We're gonna do something huge with it. Yeah. Do you want a peanut butter sandwich? Yeah. Yeah? You, you guys, do you want peanut butter oh, sandwich? Oh, they're, they're allergic to peanut butter. Oh, okay. Too bad. <laughs> okay, stiffness. Stiffness is all about um, preservation of finishes and the comfort of the people in the building. It usually sometimes gets vibration lumped in with it. So we can have things, um, um, if something bends down and we've got um, drywall under here, does our drywall crack? Um, if we have a building like this and we tip it and we rack it um, or bend it, do all of our glass windows fail? Um, as something twists, do our windows fail? Um, soil, um, do we cause differential settlement where one side of the building moves relative to the other and we crack our brick on the outside of our building? And vibration can have an impact on it as well. Um, so stiffness, don't worry about this, this isn't an equation you have to know, but we often um, talk about um, stiffness or relative stiffness with the symbol K. Um, and it is kind of the inverse of flexibility. It's the defined as the amount that a structure will deflect or rotate under a fixed amount of load. Flexibility is often represented by the symbol F. Again, don't worry about that, I just wanted to give you some nomenclature for it. Um, what we do is we set out guidelines for stiffness. Stiffness are very much only guidelines, but I can tell you if you don't follow the guidelines and the client is unhappy, they will sue you and that is the thing you are most likely to be sued about in your career is stiffness. Even though there's no loss of life, there's nothing wrong with your structure, if you don't follow those guidelines, you can very easily be sued for stiffness um, failure, essentially, because it hasn't set out the mandate that people typically do. That said, I do things all the time that don't follow the guidelines. So how do you decide when to follow the guidelines and when not to? Well, first off, start trying to follow the guidelines. And if you can, by meeting, if you just manage to meet them because you met it with strength, no problem, great, problem solved. Um, uh, if you have finishes that are easily damaged, do whatever the guidelines say. Make sure you do follow those guidelines. The, the times I don't follow the guidelines is when I have something that could have no likelihood of being damaged, is really prohibitive to the cost of the structure, and a client that understands the implications of it. That canopy for Sisters of St. Joseph that I showed you, that amazing cantilever, we talked to the architect as the client and they communicated it to the owner as the client what it took to meet the stiffness criteria and then we said if you didn't meet the stiffness criteria here's what happens and for that one for example um, it needed to be twice as deep to meet the stiffness criteria building it the way we did we said under the snow load in the code which is a one in 50 or a 1 in 30 year storm for, for, for snow, but normally it's a 1 in 50, it's a ratio of the 1 to 50 year storm, it will deflect this amount. And I think it was like 2 inches or an inch, it was something large. And the code was some, it, it could only deflect um, like half an inch, something like that. So we said, um, if you're okay with that, in a normal storm, so not that big massive storm where everybody's like worked up, um, it will deflect this amount. And they were okay with it because it wasn't a loss of life. 
Um, if we got that big deflection, it was a safe, safe thing. Nothing was going to happen to damage that. There was no finishes that were going to be damaged. Nobody could possibly be hurt. It just meant that if somebody was out there looking at the canopy, you'd be able to see that it was skewed a little bit. And everybody was okay with that. So that's a time where it's okay to not follow the guidelines. So what are the guidelines? I can tell you that even since last year, I had to go back and revise this list because at some point the wood code made a change. This guy's on the wood code and he didn't even know about that change. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to go back and make some changes between last year and this year. I'm sorry, I'm starving from... Mm, what's on here? Oh, there's jam on here too. Oh, yes. Um, so these guidelines say, if you know how long your element is, you're going to divide it by some criteria. And it varies depending on if it is a roof or a floor member, if there's snow or snow plus dead, or live or dead plus live. And then whether they are susceptible to damages or not susceptible to damages, your finishes. So drywall, susceptible to damages. Glass windows, susceptible to damage. And then we look at, is it steel, wood, concrete, or masonry? And with that, we then take our length and divide it by the number that we pulled out of this chart. And that tells us what our deflection limit is. So if we pick a beam that gives us more deflection than that, we have not met the deflection criteria. This term, I'm only teaching you how to figure out what the limit is. Next year, you will figure out what the actual deflection of a very specific beam under a very specific load is. And then you will say, does that beam meet my deflection criteria or not? So that'll be part of structures too. This term, you have to be able to pull this chart up and tell me what the deflection criteria is. <coughs> Eating a sandwich while talking isn't as easy as it looks. Okay, so length of a beam, deflection, deflection criteria, you calculate your deflection limit or the most it can deflect. A cantilever is like saying we're taking twice the length or half the criteria value. <clears throat> so whatever you pull off the chart, if it's a cantilever, divide the criteria by two. Let's take a look at an example. Here's a beam that has a 10 foot backspan or the main part of the beam and a two foot cantilever. What amount of live deflection, so not dead plus live, but live, will we accept for a wood, so it's telling us the material, floor beam, so it's a floor, not a roof, with a drywall, well, drywall tells me that it's got finishes that are susceptible to damages. That spans 10 feet and has a two foot cantilever. So we have two things we have to check. We have to check this part and we have to check this part. We often will be working in metric in this course. But sometimes the drawings we're looking at will be an imperial. This is imperial. We need to convert it to metric and figure out what our deflection limit is. I probably would have added, tell me the answer in millimeters here. And in fact, I can tell you that in the assignment, I do that. I give you some in Imperial, and you have to tell me what the metric limit is. So backspan. My 10 feet, I'm going to multiply 10 times 12 because <clears throat> there are 12 inches in a foot times 25.4 because there are 25.4 millimeters in an inch. And I'm going to get that that 10 foot beam is 3,048 millimeters long. Let's go back to a live deflection criteria for a wood floor with finishes 
that are susceptible to damage. So wood, floor, live, susceptible to damage, L divided by 360 is the criteria we have. So length divided by 360, or 3,048 millimeters divided by 360, we have an allowable deflection of 8.47 millimeters. Every member needs to be checked for both criteria. They, this question was specifically live, but we would still need to check dead plus live. And it's going to give us a different answer. And you can't say which one is governing because it's going to be dependent on what load is applied to it. And we don't know what load is applied to it yet. <clears throat> so we can't say just by looking at these numbers which one is the governing criteria. Deflection's funny that way. You kind of need to know the beam already to figure out which one is the governing criteria. Or you have to check both of them. We'll worry about that next term. This term, if I don't tell you explicitly what one you're looking for, you need to give me both. Project, you will need to give me both for the project. We had two parts here. This would also tell us for the um, cantilever. So cantilever is two feet, or two times 12 times 25.4 is 610. Okay. It's the same deflection criteria, but we've divided it by two because it's a cantilever. So 610 divided by 180 equals 3.4 millimeters. So our backspan has a deflection criteria of 8.47, and our cantilever has a deflection criteria of 3.4. Lateral has deflection criteria too. For wind, it's H divided by 500. An earthquake, depending on what type of building or what zone you're in, it's H divided by 50 or H divided by 100. We're not going to do much with this. I want you to be aware of it. And it has two things it has to meet. It has to meet the overall building, but also story to story. Because you could imagine if this building right here met the overall deflection criteria, but almost all the deflection happened on one story, that doesn't seem very good. So we have to take this height and divide it by 500 for wind and make sure it meets that criteria. This height divided by 500 and make it meet the criteria. Each story, but then it also has to meet from here to here to see if it meets the criteria. Okay, vibration can have some interesting impacts here. So a continuous vibration is a steady repeated load. Often buildings were worried about human excitation. Um, humans typically move at 2.5 hertz. In fact, I normally get people to do this exercise <clears throat> where I get you to, and there's a, usually a whole big class of people doing it, I get you to go up and down on your toes as fast as you can. And it starts to hurt your calves a little bit. I then try to get people to do it as slow as you can. In some ways, that almost hurts more. And then I tell people to do it at the rate that just seems the most comfortable. And if you look around the room, which we can't do, you will probably find that you are doing it at roughly the same rate I was. Because the human body tends to naturally move at around 2.5 hertz. It's a very comfortable movement for us. Um, and most things like dancing are um, within multiples of that. Um, I often joke that my husband, who has a funny little hiccup in his walk and cannot dance, that his upper and his upper part of his body and the lower part of his body move at two different frequencies, and that's why he dances the way he does. A, tr a transient vibration is when something is a single impact, and how long it takes to tam taper out is really important. People can handle a sudden impact. It's startling, but we handle it quite well. But if after we feel it, 
we still feel some residual movement from it. That is very unnerving for human perception. So we try to look like to make sure that the load gets damped out as quickly as we can. For that, we often use the mass of the building and friction. So the um, Olympic weightlifting floor in Gold Ring with the MRI, we were worried about transient vibrations or them throwing the weights on the floor and what it took <coughs> to dampen out that load. So we used mass by making what it was built on much more massive than the rest. And then we added friction by putting vibration isolators in there so that it couldn't even be transferred. One of the best ways to test this is with a heel drop. And it's different every year, depending on what classroom we're in, because they always move me around. But I get people to go up on their heels and drop down. Now, I'm in an old ass wood building. Ooh. Um, so uh, I feel a little bit of um, a residual um, vibration that doesn't get damped out very well. Um, so toppings for floors are really important for helping dealing with um, transient vibrations. I'm, make, I'm making this lecture take very long. I'm really sorry, guys. Amplification is the one you've probably all heard legends about. If a continuous vibration is happening at the same frequency of the building or object, it can result in amplification. This can lead to failure in very extreme cases. Um, it can be human movement or wind or seismic loads. It's one of the reasons why um, uh, military won't walk in lockstep across a bridge. Because um, if everybody is moving in time, it can cause excitation. Uh, there's actually a story of... Um, a military bridge collapsing um, because of that. Um, if you've ever been on a bridge and a runner goes by on a public pedestrian bridge, they allow more um, vibration than we typically do. In fact, if you're the one running, you start to run and it feels like the bridge is gone out from under your foot. Um, that's them trying to make sure um, they don't have the frequency at the same as human frequency. It's moving at a slightly different frequency. So the position of where the bridge is relative to your foot changes slightly and it's almost nauseating. Um, um, <clears throat> um, and they allow different um, vibration criteria on the pedestrian bridge. They accept that you will be disturbed slightly but it's not you sitting working in an office where the standards would be much higher. Here's me in an old little horrible shack of a house Dave and I had. Um, we had, we were turning this into a little office and we um, had previously put um, planks in the attic and loaded up all our storage in there. When we demoed this, we assumed there was a normal beam in here. It turned out just to be a two by four on flat, and there was um, two and a half inches of deflection right here. Hadn't failed yet, probably should have. Um, I did the calculation for this span, and it turns out we needed um, two two by tens turned this way. So instead of one two by four like this, we needed two two by tens like this. So we had to jack the ceiling up and then install those two by tens. Yeah, so here you can see, this is what it ended up being that we had to install. <clears throat> um, this is what we're trying to avoid. This truly does look like it's a picture of my house. It's actually eerie, um, but it is not. I, I keep thinking, because the house when we bought it was actually painted this color as well. Um, and that color, oddly enough, um, and as bad as our ceiling was, it wasn't quite this bad. And I've had this picture in here since before we bought this house. It's just surreal that I'm sitting in this exact <laughs> spot where it looks exactly like this. This is where I said foundations or soil with differential settlement. If um, we have, if, if we put this side on bedrock, which isn't going to move, and this side on sand, and the sand settles a little bit, our wall is going to shift somewhat. 
one of the materials most susceptible to, to deflection is brick because it has zero give and it'll get a crack and that crack becomes all in one spot rather than spread out over a bunch of spots and we see this massive crack in it that freaks everyone out. Um, and so now all of this brick is hung and this brick is resting down here. This is where bees and mice get in and I can tell you that from experience from this building. Uh, that just becomes a real problem. So deflection, if we go back to that chart, you will see that the masonry deflection was the most stringent of them all. Almost no deflection allowed. Wall, soil trying to push in, soil, soil trying to push in on the wall, um, and the wall bending. Um, lateral deformation. You can imagine if there's nothing stopping this, it wants to tip over. Um, and you guys have probably found this building models, or maybe you guys aren't far enough into it yet. You've only had one term of building models. But you tend to want something to tie those together so that it doesn't tip over. Um, we don't have time to watch these videos. Um, we'll watch them again at other points in the course. Um, but these are just fun videos. You can copy this. I'll even try to find them and post them in the links for you as well. Um, but this is a great one that shows um, deflection of um, a building during an earthquake that has a tune mass dampener in it. And the tune mass dampener is like putting water in a glass that if you try to slide it across the bar, it starts to move back and forth and stops the glass from moving a little bit. Um, what's interesting is, is that the camera is attached to the building. So the building looks like it's not moving and that the tune mass dampener is as are the people, because they're being thrown around by the earthquake. They're trying to balance themselves from moving around with the earthquake. Except for one person who holds on to something on the building, and so she looks like she's standing still, because she is perfectly moving with the camera, rather than everyone else and everything which is moving independent from the camera. <clears throat> this is a really good one for stiffness. It's the Tacoma Bridge Collapse um, in the 30s. Um, it shows amplification, resonance, sort of. There was more to it. There was um, things about the wind and the, uh, um, um, the cables. There was like a multiple stage process to it. Um, as much as they were never fully able to explain it, they actually learned a lot about how not to design something. Um, so there's much more stringent things in place um, for those types of bridges now. Stability. I'm just going to breeze through this because stability is more about intuition. Um, we have sliding, tipping, elastic stability, ponding, no load path, um, or buckling. And those can all be stability issues. Some of these lead into other issues or maybe started with another issue. So sliding is basically when we have not enough friction and our object just slides, or there's not enough force. If this, is, if this is the applied load, there's not enough force to resist it from sliding that way. So our object slides. Tipping is when there might be enough friction, but there's not enough weight or something to tie it down. This is the example of when Dave pushed me. Um, had he pushed me for either of those and I was on ice, I would have slid, I wouldn't have tipped over. In one, I tipped over, and in one, I didn't. But in either of them, if I was on ice, I would have slid. So they're two separate things, somewhat tied together because they're the same load being applied, but we have to make sure both works. We have to make sure we won't slide, and then once we won't slide, we have to make sure we don't tip. So we made sure I didn't slide by not putting me on ice, and then we had to make sure I didn't tip over. Elastic stability. Elastic stability is, <clears throat> so say we have um, this column standing here and we have a load being applied on it like this. But say this thing is slightly skewed. I put this load on it and see it wants to deflect a little bit because it's not straight down through the middle anymore. It's tipped over a little bit and you can imagine that makes it want to tip. 
And what we do is we say, okay, well, if we put, if it was this skewed and we put this load on it, we can calculate how much it would want to move. And now we know how far it is away and we can do the calculation again. If this load was applied here, how much does it want to move? And then we can do the calculation again. And if the increment of movement between each of those calculations gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we're stable. If it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we're unstable. Same idea with ponding. So ponding is if we have a little bit of deflection and it rains, for example, we have an increased amount of water in that location, which makes it want to deflect a little bit more, which makes it want to pick up more water, which makes it want to deflect a little bit more, which makes it want to pick up more water, or we begin to pond there. If, as we do those checks with more and more water being applied based on how much it moved, that we see that the deflection gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we have a stable system. If each of those calculations shows a bigger one, it's unstable, which means then that we would probably have a strength failure. So we can go from a stiffness to, we can go from a stability to a stiffness to a strength failure. I'm going to show you some other ones too. So buckling, buckling is when as I load this, it's slender and so it wants to pop out sideways. It's, it might have been, if this same element I clamped right here and pushed on it, it was strong enough, maybe, but like this, very little load makes it want to pop out sideways. That's called buckling, and that's going to be critical when we design columns next semester. Local buckling is elements within our object. So, for example, if this is the flange, oh, I'm running out of paper, if this is the flange of uh, a steel beam, for example, so imagine that this is just part of the beam, and I'm going to show you some images of it that will make it clear. That's when we get local buckling or oil canning of the steel very locally. We try, we'll talk about it next term, how we try to defeat that. So this is a stability failure. Everyone always thinks, oh, well, of course this tipped over. Look at these tiny little caissons. Well, these were actually probably just fine for distributing the load down into the soil. What they did here is they dug, they've had their building here, and they dug a big hole over here. So you can imagine the soil just wants to go like that. And then they took that soil and put it over here, increasing the load that makes the soil want to go like that. So they created a soil instability problem. Pay attention to this. This question is on your assignment. I, I don't know what happened here. Tornado, maybe? But it doesn't look like there's anything else. But this building straight up slid. I would have thought it was maybe on the back of a transport, and it slid off the transport. But they've got curtains and a fancy door on it. Normally for shipment, they don't have all of those finishes in. So I do not know how in heaven's name this building ended up here, but it certainly slid there from somewhere. Ponding. You can see that we've got extra water here that's going to make this want to deflect, which makes it attract, if it was a rainy day, makes it want to attract more water. Ponding becomes a real problem where we're renovating existing buildings and put big mechanical units on it. So buildings that didn't have a problem now have a mechanical unit that make the roof bend a little bit or deflect a little bit. Even if the building is strong enough and stiff enough, that extra deflection when it rains might cause ponding there, which can turn into a stability problem. It might not. We have to calculate it and check it. This is kind of like our buckling failure for our column. When I said that it buckled, it's because it's in compression. And as we compress it, if it's slender, it buckles. Well, do you remember in bending, when we put something in bending, one side is in compression and one side is in tension. Compression elements tend to have a desire to buckle. Tension elements don't. So in a beam, the compression side 
wants to buckle and the bottom side doesn't. But because only the top is buckling, you can see it's actually doing it here, the bottom is fine, the top isn't, it tends to twist over sideways. And now its mass is over sideways. And now it's buckling and twisting. And it's what we call a lateral torsional failure. Here is just column in buckling, just some pictures of things buckling. Um, when we were jacking that beam into place in our roof, we had a steel jack. And what we did is we took um, some two by fours and a car jack and just jacked it up and then we'd ratchet this into another spot. When we got high enough to have it where we wanted, we said, this thing was close to failing. Let's see what it takes to actually fail this two by four. Two two by fours laminated together to fail just by using a car jack. And we were able to manually fail that. We're nerds, that's what we did for fun. We like, we high-fived and opened beer. Um, had we had champagne, we would have sprayed it around, I think, because it was so fun. Here's a buckling failure. Um, uh, go trains and trains. When these, um, when these uh, rails heat up, they want to stretch, but they're bound by the rail ties. And so they end up putting spots in compression and spots in tension, and they'll pop. And that's why, um, if you've ever been on a train that had to go slow because it was a hot day, this is what they're worried about happening. And they don't want it to happen while the train's going at a high speed. At a slow speed, they can manage it. They know they have a problem, they can go back and fix it. But they don't want the speed of a high train to make all of these pop apart. Here is local buckling. You can see that this is this whole beam hasn't buckled. We don't have lateral torsional failure. We just have some local elements here buckling. And so that's local buckling, when just a small portion of one element of the object buckles. Another local buckling failure, you can see the whole thing hasn't failed, we've just got some oil canning on that top surface. So I showed you this column where the whole thing was bending out sideways. Well this, it's bending out sideways, but you see this? It's got this funny little bump in it here. That's because that's got a local buckling failure about to happen in it. A really good image of local buckling failure. So I will share, maybe we have a quick minute. This is um, a hysteresis. This is a diagram that shows how much this is moving due to some earthquake loads. So it's going back and forth. It's being loaded and unloaded and loaded and unloaded. Um, this is a casting um, from the company that I was working for at Cast Connects doing seismic testing of one of their seismic braces. I can see a real lag because I'm playing this video now. But you can see that it starts to buckle here, it starts to buckle here, but it's not failing. So it's stable until it's not. And the idea here is that it's absorbing energy, which is helping the building respond to the earthquake. Um, they're testing this to failure on purpose. It doesn't mean that the object doesn't work. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, but they needed to test it to failure for, um, uh, for code. They needed that information for code work. Um, so you can see here that it's actually flaked off all the paint because it's bent so much. Um, and you can see that it's deflecting more and more and more each time. And you can see that's how much load it's taking. It was taking more load each time. And now it's kind of hit its limit of how much load it can take. But it still hasn't failed yet. Oh, no, not, yes, there. It's just about, it started to fail. Yeah, they, they zoomed in. That pop was when that actually failed there. So that was just for fun. So the idea here is that you have to ask yourself, is everything in our building strong enough? So moment, shear, axial, torsion. Is it stiff enough? Have we met vibration criteria? Have we met deflection criteria? And is it stable? Does it want to slide? Does it want to spin? Does it want to tip? And we ask ourselves that for every object of every element and every connection in the building. And that is what we have to do as the structural engineers. 
Is it strong enough, stiff enough, and stable for every system, every element, and every connection in the building? Okay, so that was lecture number one. You should know where the architect fits in the design process. You should understand that there are different types of strength failures, and you should have a feel for strength and stability, or stiffness and stability failures. What you need to be able to do for this course is the basic math we talked about, understand the different types of strength failures, be able to recognize stiffness issues and stability issues. We're going to talk more about stability issues um, throughout this course as well, and you're going to have to draw diagrams about your part one project that show that you understand what makes your object stable. You should be able to calculate limit state designs equations and calculate allowable deflection. We haven't done much with this, so don't worry about it too much. I don't think I give you any examples like that in this assignment, but I do give you allowable deflection criteria examples. So that's week one. Uh, take a crack at your assignment. Tell me if there's any flaws. Um, if we ever run into situations where there's a mistake or a typo or something happens, we make sure that gets corrected. You won't be penalized for that. It might not show up for you right away, but we will do whatever we can. Um, make use of your TAs. They're going to be reaching out to you in the next little while to say how you can communicate with them and also what two-hour time slot each week they will each assign for them to be available to you. Um, I can't wait to uh, do the rest of the term with you guys and uh, talk to you next week.